Section 29 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. London. 3rd October 1654. Having dined here, we passed through Bishop Stortford, a pretty watered town, and so by London, late home to Say's Court, after a journey of seven hundred miles, but for the variety and agreeable refreshment after my turmoil and building. 10th October 1654. To my brother at Wotton, who had been sick. 14th October 1654. I went to visit my noble friend Mr. Hildyard, where I met the learned gentleman, my lord Angier, and Dr. Stokes, one of His Majesty's chaplains. 15th October 1654, to Betchworth Castle, to Sir Ambrose Brown, another gentleman of my sweet and native country. 24th October 1654, the good old Parson Hyam preached at Wharton Church, a plain preacher, but innocent and honest man. 23rd November 1654, I went to London to visit my cousin Fanshawe, and this day I saw one of the rarest collections of agates, onyxes and intaglios that I had ever seen, either at home or abroad, collected by a conceited old hat-maker in Blackfriars, especially one agate vase, heretofore the great Earl of Leicester's. 28th November 1654 came Lady Langham, a kinswoman of mine, to visit us. Also one Captain Cook, esteemed the best singer, after the Italian manner, of any in England. He entertained us with his voice and theabo. 30th November 1654 My birthday, being the thirty-fourth year of my age, blessing God for his providence, I went to London to visit my brother. 3rd December 1654, Advent Sunday. There being no office at the church but extempore prayers after the Presbyterian way, for now all forms were prohibited, and most of the preachers were usurpers, I seldom went to church upon solemn feasts, but either went to London, where some of the orthodox sequestered divines did privately use the common prayer, administer sacraments, etc., or else I procured one to officiate in my house. Wherefore, on the 10th, Dr. Richard Owen, the sequestered minister of Eltham, preached to my family in my library and gave us the Holy Communion. 25th December 1654, Christmas Day. No public offices in churches, but penalties on observers, so I was constrained to celebrate it at home. 1st January 1654-55 Having with my family performed the public offices of the day and begged a blessing on the year I was now entering, I went to keep the rest of Christmas at my brother's R. Evelyn at Woodcut. 19th January 1655 My wife was brought to bed of another son, being my third but second living, christened on the 26th by the name of John. 28th January 1655 A stranger preached from Colossians 3.2, inciting our affections to the obtaining heavenly things. I understood afterward that this man had been both chaplain and lieutenant to Admiral Penn, using both swords, whether ordained or not I cannot say, into such times were we fallen. 24th February 1655 I was showed a table clock whose balance was only a crystal ball sliding on parallel wires without being at all fixed but rolling from stage to stage till falling on a spring concealed from sight it was thrown up to the utmost channel again made with an imperceptible declivity in this continual vicissitude of motion prettily entertaining the eye every half minute and the next half giving progress to the hand that showed the hour, 
and giving notice by a small bell, so as in a hundred and twenty half minutes, or periods of the bullets falling on the ejaculatory spring, the clock part struck. This very extraordinary piece, richly adorned, had been presented by some German prince to our late king, and was now in the possession of the usurper, valued at two hundred pounds. 2nd March 1655. Mr. Simpson, the king's jeweller, showed me a most rich agate cup of an escalop shape, and having a figure of Cleopatra at the scroll, her body, hair, mantle and veil, of the several natural colours. It was supported by a half Mark Antony, the colours rarely natural, and the work truly antique, but I conceive they were of several pieces, had they been all of one stone, it were invaluable. 18th March 1655. Went to London on purpose to hear that excellent preacher, Dr. Jeremy Taylor, on Matthew 14.17, showing what were the conditions of obtaining eternal life. Also concerning abatements for unavoidable infirmities, how cast on the accounts of the cross. On the 31st I made a visit to Dr. Jeremy Taylor to confer with him about some spiritual matters, using him thenceforward as my ghostly father. I beseech God Almighty to make me ever mindful of and thankful for his heavenly assistances. 2nd April 1655 this was the first week that my uncle Pretiman, being parted with his family from me, I began housekeeping, till now sojourning with him in my own house. 9th April 1655 I went to see the great ship, newly built by the usurper Oliver, carrying 96 brass guns and 1,000 tons burden. In the prow was Oliver on horseback, trampling six nations underfoot, a Scot, Irishman, Dutchman, Frenchman, Spaniard and English, as was easily made out by their several habits. A fame held a laurel over his insulting head, the word God with us. 15th April 1655 I went to London with my family to celebrate the Feast of Easter. Dr Wilde preached at St Gregory's. The ruling powers conniving at the use of the liturgy, etc., in the church alone. In the afternoon, Mr. Pearson, since Bishop of Chester, preached at Eastcheap, but was disturbed by an alarm of fire, which about this time was very frequent in the city. 29th May 1655. I sold Preston to Colonel Morley. 17th June 1655. There was a collection for the persecuted churches and Christians in Savoy, remnants of the ancient Albigenses. 3rd July 1655. I was shown a pretty Torella described with all the circles and showing all the magnetic deviations. 14th July 1655. Came Mr Pratt, my old acquaintance at Rome, also Sir Edward Hales, Sir Joseph Tufton, with Mr Seymour. 1st August 1655, I went to Dorking to see Mr Charles Howard's amphitheatre, garden or solitary recess, being fifteen acres environed by a hill. He showed us divers rare plants, caves and a laboratory. Albury 10th August 1655, to Albury to visit Mr. Howard, who had begun to build and alter the gardens much. He showed me many rare pictures, particularly the moor on horseback, Erasmus as big as the life by Holbein, and Madonna in miniature by Oliver, but above all the skull carved in wood by Albert Durer, for which his father was offered one hundred pounds. Also Albert's head by himself, with diverse rare agates, intaglios, and other curiosities. 21st August 1655. I went to Reigate to visit Mrs Carey and my Lady Peterborough's in an ancient monastery well in repair, but the park much defaced. 
The house is nobly furnished. The chimney piece in the great chamber, carved in wood, was of Henry the Eighth and was taken from a house of his in Bletchingley. At Reigate was now the Archbishop of Armagh, the learned James Usher, whom I went to visit. He received me exceeding kindly. In discourse with him, he told me how great the loss of time was to study much the Eastern languages, that, excepting Hebrew, there was little fruit to be gathered of exceeding labour, that, besides some mathematical books, the Arabic itself had little considerable, that the best text was the Hebrew Bible, that Septuagint was finished in seventy days, but full of errors, about which he was then writing, that St. Hierome's was to be valued next the Hebrew, also that the seventy translated the Pentateuch only, the rest was finished by others, that the Italians at present understood but little Greek, and Kircher was a mountebank, that Mr. Selden's best book was his titles of honour, that the church would be destroyed by sectaries who would in all likelihood bring in popery. In conclusion, he recommended to me the study of philology above all human studies, and so, with his blessing, I took my leave of this excellent person and returned to Wotton. 27th August, 1655. I went to Box Hill to see those rare natural bowers, cabinets and shady walks in the box copses. Hence we walked to Mickleham and saw Sir F. Stiffold's seat, environed with elm trees and walnuts innumerable, and of which last he told us they received a considerable revenue. Here are such goodly walks and hills, shaded with yew and box, as render the place extremely agreeable, it seeming from these evergreens to be summer all the winter. 28th August 1655. Came that renowned mathematician Mr. Ortred to see me, I sending my coach to bring him to Wotton, being now very aged. Among other discourse, he told me he thought water to be the philosopher's first matter, and that he was well persuaded of the possibility of their elixir. He believed the sun to be a material fire, the moon a continent, as appears by the late selenographers. He had strong apprehensions of some extraordinary event to happen the following year, from the calculation of coincidence with the diluvian period, and added that it might possibly be to convert the Jews by our Saviour's visible appearance, or to judge the world and therefore his word was parate in ocursum. He said original sin was not met with in the Greek fathers, yet he believed the thing. This was from some discourse on Dr. Taylor's late book, which I had lent him. 16th September 1655 Preached at St. Gregory's one Darnell on Psalm 4.4 Concerning the benefit of self-examination, more learning in so short a time as an hour I have seldom heard. 17th September 1655 Received £2,600 of Mr. Hurt for the manor of Worley Magna in Essex, purchased by me some time since. The taxes were so intolerable that they ate up the rents, etc., surcharged as that county had been above all others during our unnatural war. 19th September 1655. Came to see me Sir Edward Hales, Mr. Ashmole, Mr. Harlackenton and Mr. Thornhill. And the next day I visited Sir Henry Newton at Charlton, where I met the Earl of Winchelsea and Lady Beauchamp, daughter to the Lord Capel. On Sunday afternoon I frequently stayed at home to catechise and instruct my family, those exercises universally ceasing in the parish churches, so as people had no principles and grew very ignorant of even the common points of Christianity, all devotion being now placed in hearing sermons and discourses of speculative and national things. 26 September 1655 I went to see Colonel Blount's subterranean warren and drank of the wine of his vineyard, which was good for little. 30th of September, 1655. 
Sir Nicholas Crisp came to treat with me about his vast design of a mole to be made for ships in part of my grounds at Say's Court. 3rd November 1655 I had accidentally discourse with a Persian and a Greek concerning the devastation of Poland by the late incursion of the Swedes. London 27th November 1655 To London about Sir Nicholas Crisp's designs. I went to see York House and Gardens belonging to the former Great Buckingham but now much ruined through neglect. Thence to visit honest and learned Mr. Hartlib, a public-spirited and ingenious person who had propagated many useful things and arts. He told me of the castles which they set for ornament on their stoves in Germany, he himself being a Lithuanian, as I remember, which are furnished with small ordnance of silver on the battlements, out of which they discharge excellent perfumes about the rooms, charging them with a little powder to set them on fire and disperse the smoke, and in truth no more than need, for their stoves are sufficiently nasty. He told me of an ink that would give a dozen copies, moist sheets of paper being pressed on it and remain perfect, and a receipt how to take off any print without the least injury to the original. This gentleman was master of innumerable curiosities and very communicative. I returned home that evening by water and was afflicted for it with a cold that had almost killed me. This day came forth a protector's edict or proclamation prohibiting all ministers of the Church of England from preaching or teaching any schools in which he imitated the apostate Julian with the decimation of all the royal party's revenues throughout England. 14th December 1655 I visited Mr Hobbes, the famous philosopher of Malmesbury, with whom I had been long acquainted in France. Now were the Jews admitted. 25th December 1655 There was no more notice taken of Christmas Day in churches, I went to London, where Dr. Wilde preached the funeral sermon of preaching, this being the last day, after which Cromwell's proclamation was to take place that none of the Church of England should dare either to preach or administer sacraments, teach schools, etc., on pain of imprisonment or exile. So this was the most mournful day that in my life I had seen, or the Church of England herself, since the Reformation to the great rejoicing of both Papist and Presbyter. So pathetic was his discourse that it drew many tears from the auditory. Myself, wife and some of our family received the communion. God made me thankful, who hath hitherto provided for us the food of our souls as well as bodies. The Lord Jesus pity our distressed church and bring back the captivity of Zion. 5th January 1655-56 Came to visit me my Lord Lyle, son to the Earl of Leicester, with Sir Charles Oosley, two of the usurper's council, Mr John Harvey and John Denham the poet. 18th January 1656 Went to Eltham on foot, being a great frost, but a mist falling as I returned gave me such a room as kept me within doors near a whole month after. 5th February 1656 was shown me a pretty perspective and well represented in a triangular box the great church of Harlem in Holland to be seen through a small hole at one of the corners and contrived into a handsome cabinet. It was so rarely done that all the artists and painters in town flocked to see and admire it. 10th February 1656 I heard Dr Wilkins preach before the Lord Mayor in St Paul's, showing how obedience was preferable to sacrifice. He was a most obliging person who had married the protector's sister and took great pains to preserve the universities from the ignorant sacrilegious commanders and soldiers who would fain have demolished all places and persons that pretended to learning. 
11th February 1656, I ventured to go to White Hall, where of many years I had not been, and found it very glorious and well furnished, as far as I could safely go, and was glad to find they had not much defaced that rare piece of Henry the Seventh, etc., done on the walls of the King's Privy Chamber. 14th February 1656, I dined with Mr. Barclay, son of Lord Barclay of Barclay Castle, where I renewed my acquaintance with my Lord Bruce, my fellow traveller in Italy. 19th February 1656, went with Dr. Wilkins to see Barlow, the famous painter of fowls, beasts and birds. 4th March 1656, this night I was invited by Mr. Roger Lestrange to hear the incomparable Lubasa on the violin. His variety on a few notes and plain ground, with that wonderful dexterity, was admirable. Though a young man, yet so perfect and skilful that there was nothing, however cross and perplexed, brought to him by our artists, which he did not play off at sight, with ravishing sweetness and improvements to the astonishment of our best masters. In sum, he played on the single instrument a full concert, so as the rest flung down their instruments, acknowledging the victory. As to my own particular, I stand to this hour amazed that God should give so great perfection to so young a person. There were at that time as excellent in their profession as any were thought to be in Europe, Paul Wheeler, Mr. Mell and others, till this prodigy appeared. I can no longer question the effects we read of in David's harp to charm evil spirits, or what is said some particular notes produced in the passions of Alexander, and that King of Denmark. 12th April 1656 Mr. Barclay and Mr. Robert Boyle that excellent person, great virtuoso, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Wilkins, dined with me at Say's Court, when I presented Dr. Wilkins with my rare burning glass. In the afternoon, we all went to Colonel Blount to see his newly invented ploughs. 22nd April 1656. Came to see Mr. Henshaw and Sir William Paston's son since Earl of Yarmouth. Afterward I went to see His Majesty's house at Eltham, both palace and chapel, in miserable ruins, the noble woods and park destroyed by Rich, the rebel. 6th May 1656. I brought Monsieur Lefranc, a young French Sorbonnist, a proselyte, to converse with Dr. Taylor. They fell to dispute on original sin in Latin upon a book newly published by the doctor who was much satisfied with the young man. Thence to see Mr. Dugdale, our learned antiquary and herald. Returning, I was shown the three vast volumes of Father Kircher's Obeliscus Pafilius and Egyptiacus. In the second volume, I found the hieroglyphic I first communicated and sent to him at Rome by the hands of Mr. Henshaw, whom he mentioned. I designed it from the stone itself brought me to Venice from Cairo by Captain Powell. 7th May 1656 I visited Dr. Taylor and prevailed on him to propose Monsieur Lefranc to the bishop that he might have orders, I having some time before brought him to a full consent to the Church of England, her doctrine and discipline, in which he had till of late made some difficulty. So he was this day ordained both deacon and priest by the Bishop of Meath. I paid the fees to his lordship, who was very poor and in great want. To that necessity were our clergy reduced. In the afternoon I met Alderman Robinson to treat with Mr. Papillon about the marriage of my cousin George Chook with Mrs. Fontaine. 8th May 1656 I went to visit Dr. Wilkins at White Hall when I first met with Sir P. Neal, famous for his optic glasses. Greterix, the mathematical instrument maker, showed me his excellent invention to quench fire. 12th May 1656 
was published my essay on Lucretius with innumerable errata by the negligence of Mr. Triplett, who undertook the correction of the press in my absence. Little of the Epicurean philosophy was then known among us. 28th May 1656 I dine with Newport, the Holland ambassador, who received me with extraordinary courtesy. I found him a judicious, crafty and wise man. He gave me excellent cautions as to the danger of the times and the circumstances our nation was in. I remember the observation he made upon the ill success of our former parliaments and their private animosities and little care of the public. Came to visit me the old Marquis of Argyle, since executed, Lord Lothian and some other Scotch noblemen, all strangers to me. Note the Marquis took the turtle doves in the aviary for owls. The Earl of Southampton, since treasurer, and Mr. Spencer, brother to the Earl of Sunderland, came to see my garden. 7th July 1656. I began my journey to see some parts of the northeast of England, but the weather was so excessively hot and dusty I shortened my progress. 8th July 1656. To Colchester, a fair town but now wretchedly demolished by the late siege, especially the suburbs which were all burned but were then repairing. The town is built on a rising ground, having fair meadows on one side, and a river with a strong ancient castle, said to have been built by King Coilus, father of Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, of whom I find no memory, save at the pinnacle of one of their wool staple houses, where is a statue of Coilus in wood, wretchedly carved. The walls are exceedingly strong, deeply trenched, and filled with earth. It has six gates, and some watch-towers, and some handsome churches. But what was shown us as a kind of miracle at the outside of the castle, the wall where Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyell, those valiant and noble persons who so bravely behaved themselves in the last siege, were barbarously shot, murdered by Ireton in cold blood, after surrendering on articles, having been disappointed of relief from the Scotch army which had been defeated with the King at Worcester. The place was bare of grass for a large space, all the rest of it abounding with herbage. For the rest, this is a ragged and factious town, now swarming with sectaries. Their trading is in cloth with the Dutch, and bays and says with Spain. It is the only place in England where these stuffs are made unsophisticated. It is also famous for oysters and a ringo root, growing hereabout, and candid for sale. Went to Dedham, a pretty country town, having a very fair church, finely situated, the valley well watered. Here I met with Dr Stokes, a young gentleman, but an excellent mathematician. This is a clothing town, as most are in Essex, but lies in the unwholesome hundreds. Hence to Ipswich, doubtless one of the sweetest, most pleasant, well-built towns in England. It has twelve fair churches, many noble houses, especially the Lord Devereux, a brave quay, and commodious harbour being about seven miles from the main, an ample market-place. Here was born the great Cardinal Wolsey, who began a palace here, which was not finished. I had the curiosity to visit some Quakers here in prison, a new fanatic sect of dangerous principles who show no respect to any man, magistrate or other, and seem a melancholy, proud sort of people, and exceedingly ignorant. One of these was said to have fasted twenty days, but another, endeavouring to do the like, perished on the tenth when he would have eaten but could not. 10th July 1656. I returned homeward, passing again through Colchester, and by the way, near the ancient town of Chelmsford, saw New Hall, built in a park by Henry the Seventh and Eighth, and given by Queen Elizabeth to the Earl of Sussex, who sold it to the late great Duke of Buckingham, 
and since seized on by Oliver Cromwell, pretended protector. It is a fair old house, built with brick, low, being only of two storeys, as the manor then was. The gatehouse better, the court large and pretty, the staircase of extraordinary wideness, with a piece representing Sir Francis Drake's action in the year 1580, an excellent sea piece. The galleries are trifling, the hall is noble, the garden a fair plot, and the whole seat well accommodated with water. But above all, I admired the fair avenue planted with stately lime trees in four rows for near a mile in length. It has three descents, which is the only fault, and may be reformed. There is another fair walk of the same at the Mall and Wilderness, within a tennis court and pleasant terrace toward the park, which was well stored with deer and ponds. 11th July 1656. Came home by Greenwich Ferry, where I saw Sir J. Winter's project of charring sea coal to burn out the sulphur and render it sweet. He did it by burning the coals in such earthen pots as the glass men melt their metal, so firing them without consuming them, using a bar of iron in each crucible or pot, which bar has a hook at one end, that so the coals being melted in a furnace with other crude sea coals under them may be drawn out of the pot sticking to the iron, whence they are beaten off in great half-exhausted cinders, which being rekindled make a clear, pleasant chamber fire, deprived of their sulphur and arsenic malignity. What success it may have, time will discover. End of section 29